Good evening. Um, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Peter Weiner to you tonight. Uh, Peter is a native of Dallas, Texas, but spent his formative years in Richmond, uh, Richland, uh, Washington, and went to earn a degree at the University of Washington. He served in three Republican administrations, that of Ronald Reagan, George H.W. Bush, and George W. Bush. In his mid-20s, he was a speechwriter for Secretary of Education William Bennett before becoming special assistant to the director of the Office of National Drug Control Policy, William Bennett. He was then executive director for the policy uh, uh, for Empower America, a group that had been founded by William Bennett, Jack Kemp, uh, and Jean Kirkpatrick. Um, he served uh, George W. Bush as deputy director of speech writing in 2001 and became head of the White House Office of Strategic Initiatives in 2002. Um, he currently is a senior fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center, and he is also a fellow of the Trinity Forum. Uh, Mr. Weiner is a contributing opinion writer for the New York Times and a contributing editor uh, at the Atlantic Monthly. He has, has been the author or co-author of three books, The Death of Politics, How to Heal Our Frayed Republic After Trump. Secondly, uh, City of Man, Religion and Politics in a New Era with Michael Gerson. Uh, and Wealth and Justice, the Morality of Democratic Capitalism with Arthur Brooks. Um, a leading conservative critic of Donald Trump, the death of, uh, death of politics serves as a spirited defense of politics while pro providing a path toward recovery. Um, Pete ha and his wife Cindy live in McLean, Virginia. And they have three children, John Paul, Christine, and David. Um, it seems like a million years ago, uh, but in the mid to late 70s, I taught political science in several colleges. At that time, those who, like me, studied American politics thought we had a pretty good sense of what made the American polity tick. We use terms like pluralism and separation of powers and log rolling and cross-cutting cleavages and interest group liberalism to describe what we saw. I wonder now what I would have, I would have to say if I taught those same courses today. I might just have to stand mute in front of my students. Um, to paraphrase the words of a song Judy Collins sang long ago, I really don't know my America at all. <laughs> and that's why we need to hear from people of goodwill and Christian conscience across the American political spectrum about how we can bring back, bring, be bringing healing to our beloved and frayed republic. So we welcome you warmly, Pete, into our midst. Please share what you have learned with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Paul and Heather and Theo, for your uh, kind words uh, and introduction. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming out on this Tuesday evening. I appreciate it very much, and uh, it's a real honor to be speaking at the McClendon um, lecture. I've been here before, and it's, uh, it's been a wonderful experience. And uh, not only the people here, but the spirit that animates this, uh, this church and the people in it um, is one that I find uh, very edifying and, and attractive. So it's, it's a delight to be uh, back here with, uh, with you. I'd like to begin um, 
my remarks this evening with a story uh, that I think offers a window into our times. In May 2016, a motorist uh, named Casey McWade had an accident on the interstate in western North Carolina, and she called a mechanic for a tow. The mechanic couldn't come, so he sent a friend from another company, and in due course, Ken Shupi of the Shupi Max Towing reached her, um, but as he began preparing to tow her, he noticed uh, a Bernie Sanders sticker on the bumper. Shupi was a Trump supporter, and so he told McWade that he would not accept her business, and he s suggested that she call the government for help, and he drove away. I'm really not interested in doing business with that clientele, he later told the local TV news station WLOS. Asked if he thought it was fair to leave a motor stranded, he replied, it's not fair, but it's the norm nowadays. It's the world in which we live. Indeed, this is the world in which we live, and the shoe could just as easily have been on the other foot. It could have been a Sanders supporter who left a Trump supporter stranded on the roadside. We're a long way from the ethic of the Good Samaritan. Um, today, the two uh, political parties in America, Democratic and Republican Party, are ideologically pure and farther apart than any time since Reconstruction period uh, following the Civil War. Liberal Republicans and conservative Democrats are nearly extinct. But what's most notable is that Americans have also begun to sort themselves not just politically, but also in terms of lifestyle choices and interests by geography and by faith. We increasingly live in separate worlds, interacting less often, understanding one another less well. So we are deeply divided. Uh, and one way to measure the current state of our division is what social scientists call uh, affective polarization, which refers not to differences in what partisans believe, but differences in their subjective feelings toward one another. Um, and I do want to mention that some of the data that I um, use uh, here uh, in the next few minutes and that anecdote um, come from a good friend of mine, uh, Jonathan Rausch, who, who wrote a really um, excellent essay in the, in the current issue of uh, National Affairs magazine called Beyond Polarization. In any event, um, the Pew Research Center pointed out uh, a half dozen, uh, a half a decade ago, uh, that the share of Republicans who have very unfavorable opinions of the Democratic Party has jumped from 17 to 43 percent in the last 20 years. Similarly, the share of Democrats with very negative opinions of the Republican Party also has more than doubled from 16% to 38%. But those numbers tell only part of the story. Among Republicans and Democrats who have a very unfavorable impression of the other party, the vast majority say the opposing party's policies represent a threat to the nation's well-being. In Pew's polling, more than three quarters of respondents in both parties concur that Republicans and Democratic voters can't even agree on basic facts. Uh, and that's a problem in a free republic. If, uh, if you can agree on basic facts and have arguments about the solutions, that's one thing. If you can't agree on basic facts, you uh, end up in a kind of uh, epistemological anarchy uh, where everything is up for grabs, and that makes things much, much harder. Uh, in 2016, according to Pew, 62% of highly politically engaged Republicans and 70% of highly politically engaged Democrats said the other party makes them feel afraid. As, uh, as John Rausch puts it, when one ponders those things and other such findings, one is forced to reflect that the word hate is too strong, but it is, alas, in the right ballpark for the inter-party feelings right now, because what we fear, we also tend to hate. Fully 70% of Democrats say Republicans are more closed-minded than other Americans. 42% of Democrats say Republicans are more dishonest than other Americans. 35% say they're more immoral, and 33% say they're more unintelligent. On the flip side, 52% of Republicans view Democrats as more close-minded than other Americans. 47% say Democrats are more immoral, 46% lazier, and 45% uh, more dishonest. A person told the Washington Post that American democracy, and of apropos what Paul was, was saying, uh, has become a rock-throwing contest. Uh, and Ellen Collins, an independent who is a retired uh, data architect in Dayton, Ohio, put it this way, 
This country is a mess. There's no civility. Friends are now enemies. At a lunch not long ago, a colleague of mine, whom I respect for sobriety and wisdom, told me, our relationships with our fellow citizens is defined by spontaneous contempt and spontaneous anger. He added, we have broken apart. We can't even talk to the other side. We don't even need to consider the counter arguments. It's sufficient to be scornful. And then he said this, people find liberation in contempt. It's a labor to show sympathy for the views of others. I'm guessing a lot of you uh, can relate to this, uh, and I know I can. Um, I'll tell you a story um, that happened to me. It, it had to do with uh, Joe Klein. Uh, Joe was a, um, when I first met him, he was a columnist in the 1990s at Newsweek, a really excellent columnist. And we became friends. Joe was always somewhat more liberal uh, than I was, but, but not dramatically so. And we had a fair amount of common interests, including the work of faith-based organizations uh, in the healing of, of people's lives. And there was a genuine respect and affection uh, and interest beyond politics that we had. Um, then I went into the Bush administration in 2001. And uh, over time, it became clear that Joe thought that I had gone over to the, uh, to the dark side. Um, that, uh, that, the, that the good Pete had been, had been consumed um, by, uh, by something more, uh, more malevolent. Um, I thought he was being unfair in, in his appraisal of me and of the president. Uh, neither of us really particularly gave ground. Uh, and um, all of a sudden, both of us were eager to see the flaws in the other that had heretofore been, uh, been um, we, we had been unaware of. And um, he wrote some things when I was in the White House. I was somewhat limited in, in my capacity to respond then. But then I left the White House, and our antipathy went public. And it's a matter of public record. So if you Google us, you can, you can read the exchanges. Um, but it got intense, and it got somewhat personal. Uh, you all can, can, can decide for yourself, if you look at it, um, what, to, what to make of it. Um, but you know, when I was going through that, I had a nice justification for it. Uh, I said, you know, he, he threw the first punch, and, um, and I'm not just a, 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 you know, a blocking dummy here. Um, if, if he says things I think are unfair, I have every right to respond, and I did. Uh, and so it goes, and so it went, and so it escalated. Um, but I was never fully comfortable with it, uh, and at least the people who knew me best, uh, especially my wife, Cindy, um, knew that that was not ultimately where things should stay. And so um, after a few years, I, I reached out to Joe. I tried once, and it, re it really didn't go anywhere. But then I tried again the summer of 2015, and I emailed him, and he, and he emailed me back. And we actually had a nice warm exchange. Um, and we decided to read at, meet at the Jefferson Hotel, uh, a few several blocks from, from here. And I guess fittingly, we were coming at the hotel from different sides uh, of, uh, of the street. Uh, different directions. And uh, when we saw each other, uh, before a single word was said, we embraced, uh, actually. And uh, we had a wonderful uh, breakfast, and reconciliation uh, was underway. Um, and politics had splintered that relationship, um, but it was back together. But it took time, uh, and it took intentionality. Those things aren't, uh, aren't easy. Um, so when I talk about the inflammation of poli that politics can cause, I, I know of what I, uh, of what I speak. So with the, that story in, in mind and with the data that I mentioned in mind, what are some of the steps that we can begin to take to heal um, our frayed republic? And this applies for uh, people who are non-Christians for sure, but I would say particularly for people of the Christian faith, and I'll have a few words to say about that later, and then during the q and I'm happy to get into it in more detail. Um, but for one thing, and it's probably for the most obvious thing, we can reward leaders who demonstrate integrity and appeal to our better angels, um, not our uh, worse uh, impulses. Um, that goes for all political leaders. I would say uh, that primus inter paris, first among equals, would be the president, because that's the person that uh, everybody votes for. It obviously has the biggest megaphone of, um, of all. Uh, and. Um, and I think it matters who is, uh, who is president when it comes to um, the, the, the healing of the country or the divisions of the, uh, of the country. And I do think we need to create a constituency for leadership that prizes integrity and esteems honor. 
Uh, here's a simple 10-word rule that applies to our politics. Citizens who demand more uh, will yield politicians who offer more. Just to say that again. Citizens who demand more will yield politicians uh, who offer more. It is a responsive system. For all of its faults and failures, it is a responsive system. Uh, we can also care enough about truth to reject propaganda and lies from politicians who spew them. We can inform ourselves about the issues and vote in elections, like today in Virginia. We did our duty. We went out and did it and voted. You can do it at every level. Uh, each of us can call members of Congress. You can write them. You can attend town hall meetings, which actually are especially um, impactful. You can tweet and tag them. It's a truism in politics. The way to make those in public uh, life see the light is to help them feel the heat. To put it another way, we can be active participants in America's political life, not just spectators. And if you think this sounds banal, just remember that the great inflection point for America came in 1860 because the president we elected was Abraham Lincoln rather than John Breckinridge or Stephen A. Douglas. The future course and trajectory of the nation was decided on the first Tuesday of November 1860, and that matters. And whether you like him or dislike him, uh, consider this. Donald Trump owes his victory in the Electoral College to three states, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan, that he won by a total of 77,774 votes out of more than 136 million ballots cast. So less than 78,000 votes out of 136 million um, ballots cast. There are other things that we can do to heal our frayed republic. Social media platforms have been weaponized over the last three years. So for starters, we need to shut down uh, the sophisticated disinformation operation run by foreign governments, in particular Russia, but soon, and I probably more ominously, China. Uh, social media platforms need to be held accountable, so I'm certainly open to more regulations in those industries. Education is surely part of the answer, uh, starting with civic literacy as a way to improve civic knowledge and shape democratic attitudes. We can revitalize summer leadership and citizenship programs. Some of you may be familiar with Boys State and Girls State, which are basically week-long uh, simulations of state and local government for high school students. And another area that offers some hope is, I think, voluntary national service, which entails a sense of purpose and patriotism and connects people of different classes, ethnicities, races, uh, and uh, life experiences. When people work together side by side for common purpose, political uh, differences are de-intensified. It was interesting, William F. Buckley, who was the dean of the conservative movement for many, many years, really decades, founded National Review in the 1950s, and for a time was, was almost alone as, a, as an intellectual conservative figure, wrote a book in 1990 uh, called Gratitude, which was about national service. And he talks about how life-shaping uh, that time in the military was for him. Um, and he felt like that that was the kind of thing that uh, all people, particularly young people, could, could benefit from. Um, also, uh, it, one of the more encouraging developments in recent years uh, is the creation of national programs like Better Angels and local programs like Speak Your Peace, the Civility Project, which is in Duluth. And their explicit mission is to model how people who disagree can do so responsibly uh, and without rancor. The Better Angels uh, program has what they call um, zones of depolarization. Their purpose is not to change minds. This is very important. It's to help people listen well. It's a very, very different, different task. And if you, if you watch how the um, Better Angels uh, conducts the programs, it's actually modeled very intentionally on marriage counseling. Uh, so if you've ever been in marriage counseling or know people who have or been a marriage counselor yourself, you know that one of the things that's so important is to try and calm people down and allow one spouse to hear the other spouse um, before responding. But much of what I believe uh, needs to be done, and all of those things I think are, are ideas worth thinking about, um, but much of what needs to be done I think lies with something deeper and more fundamental. And that's in the realm of individual attitudes and individual lives and how we act and what we model and the convictions, uh, in the conviction that if we change ourselves, we can change our neighborhood, we can change our community, and ultimately we can change uh, our nation. One person acting alone may not make much of a difference, but many people acting together can create a culture, a movement, and a new way of life. 
So with that in mind, here are some things uh, that I think each of us can do to become agents of reconciliation and understanding in an age of anger. First, I think we need to place uh, politics in its proper context, which is to be uh, a part of our lives, but not to have a place of supreme importance in our lives. Um, and I think that's gotten twisted around some. Um, I've found probably more than any time in my life in politics that there is a kind of intensity uh, and animation that accompanies politics that's just unusual and I think ultimately unhealthy. I'm someone who believes very deeply in the importance of politics. My book is mostly a defense of politics. I think it matters because I think justice matters. And politics, while well, it's about a lot of things, is finally and fundamentally about justice. But it can become too important. And I think our politics has become deeply tribal. Our friendships should not be determined solely or primarily by political affiliations. Uh, years ago, I wrote my friend and mentor, uh, Steve Hayner. Um, and I was worried that our differences over a particular political issue uh, that uh, we both had strong feelings about uh, might hurt our relationship. Our relationship mattered uh, more to me than politics, uh, I told him, and I didn't want a breach to occur. And he wrote me this, I want to assure you that I don't think that our disagreements on most anything could affect our relationship. My love for you has nothing to do with your views. My relationship with Steve, who died in uh, 2015, he was president of InterVarsity, and, um, and then it, w when he passed away, um, he was uh, president of a seminary. Um, that relationship was among the deepest in my life. I'd known him since college. I was a student at University of Washington. He was associate pastor at University Presbyterian Church uh, in Seattle. And he had accompanied me through uh, times of joy and hardship. And that insulated our relationship against mere political differences. But the main point applies even to friendships that may have taken root in the soil of politics. We need to work to stay in relationship with people despite deep differences um, of opinion. I want to uh, just share with you uh, one other anecdote which um, I thought was, was relevant here. Um, from time to time, I send out um, email links to worship songs, Christian worship songs. And um, this was in May, and I sent one out. Um, it's a song that I happened to like um, and, and, and was listening to called No Longer Slaves by Bethel Music. Um, and it was in a spectacular setting. It was in the uh, southern steppes in Jerusalem. And um, so the refrain is, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. And so that had resonance with me. And, and, and I, um, I said that I had noticed that there was a lot of fear uh, that, that uh, uh, I was running into these days. And I had a very short paragraph where I said that uh, even among Christians who have very different perspectives, pro and anti-Trump, political and theological and conservatives and progressives, um, because the moment we're in, uh, we're seeing a lot of anger. And much of it, I said, was rooted in fear. But then I went on to do a kind of meditation or reflection that most of the fear I saw was in um, people's individual lives, in important relationships that were fracturing, uh, in fears about finances or health, um, and, um, and a kind of anxiety. But in the end, I said that as people of the Christian faith, we have this deep confidence that God is the author of our story, um, that we're part of that drama. Uh, and though there can be individual chapters of great hardship, in the end, we do believe, um, as people of faith, that God is, is in control, and that can relieve the fear. I sent this to a woman who we had gone, my wife and I had gone to church with her, her and her husband in the 1990s, and she had become a Trump supporter during 2016. I was not. I was one of the earliest and most vocal cr critics of, um, of Trump. And um, she was on my distribution list, and I could tell that I needed to take her off. <laughs> um, <laughs> because I was provoking her, uh, and I thought there's no point in provoking her. So, Anyway, when I sent out this uh, email, I sent it to her because I thought maybe this is a way to connect in a non-political sphere. Uh, maybe we can reconnect. So I did, and I sent it to a bunch of other people. She wrote me back an email, and it said, uh, Dear Pete, your message linking to this lovely song and trans message, transcendent message that it bears would have credibility if you hadn't succumbed to the temptation to vilify the name Trump yet again. Frankly speaking, it is because of such relentless attacks 
that the Trump-hating memes persist and intentionally stoke people's fears? What must you think of your fellow men and women that you need to remind them constantly about fearing or hating Donald Trump? And please don't feign lack of hatred. It's painfully uh, uh, transparent. But they, uh, must they be constantly reminded to think the way you do because they cannot think for themselves? Or is your target audience more the Washington DC crowd who snicker in unison at every bar, veiled and otherwise against Donald Trump? I know the crowd well, and they lack the self-awareness to recognize how foolish they sound. Pete, as the saying goes, Donald Trump lives rent-free in your head. I have a feeling he pays for your salary, too. Why not shake him loose and focus on a genuine spirit of Christian kindness, compassion, and edification? Construct rather than destruct. But if you cannot shake him loose, please spare the sanctimony in your criticism. I'm beginning to question the ethics in the Ethics and Public Policy Center. In conclusion, I, th I thought I had asked quite some time ago to be removed from your email list. I ask again now to be removed, as I have no interest in the repetitive and negative harangues. So um, that was interesting. That wasn't the intent. Um, so 15 years ago, probably 10 years ago, I would have written her a point-by-point uh, -point rebuttal uh, that would have shattered her her arguments. But I didn't do it this time. And I wrote instead, uh, I actually briefly took up the issue and I, and I quoted what I said. Uh, and I said, there's something else going on. It's quite likely um, that you have feelings of deep frustration toward me uh, for my past writings of Trump that were separate from what I sent out. Then I said, look, uh, why don't we get, get together for lunch? I'll buy. Um, and we're not going to change each other's opinions on Donald Trump, but maybe we can listen to each other a little bit better. And it would be a shame if people whose relationship was built on faith was shattered because of politics. Um, we had her and her husband over for, uh, for, for lunch. Um, and I said, and maybe we should just kind of try and model what these kind of, uh, how, how, how to, to deal with, with these kind of differences. To her credit, uh, she wrote back a very warm note. Um, and we met at Jay Gilbert's out in McLean. Um, and we had a very nice lunch. Uh, most of it was not politics. It was sort of catching up on live. But when we did talk about politics, I um, probably listened 70% of the time. And I just asked her questions. Who do you listen to? What do you read? How do you feel um, about things? Um, and it was interesting. It was helpful to me. I've done this with, with a number of people. Um, and so the relationship was, was restored, and in a way I'm glad because she now attends the church we do it too, so it would have been awkward. Uh, but uh, the point is that keeping politics um, in its proper frame right now uh, isn't easy, and that's particularly true in this city. It can be done, it needs to be done, but we're in a different, uh, different area than before. Second uh, thing I think we need to do is divest ourselves um, of our sense of self-worth. And, and our sense of self-worth from our politics. And by that, I mean we need to stop viewing criticisms of our political uh, views as an attack on our personhood, our integrity, and our character. We also need to alter our mindset about others. So we stop treating those who have views that are different than us as stupid, malicious, and filled with ill intentions. That is such an easy place to go. Um, people go so quickly to attacks on motivations. It's much easier to attack people's motivations than it is to answer their arguments. And we have to fight to remind ourselves that people who disagree with us are not enemies of the state. Often, not always, but often, they're good, impressive, and honorable people who simply see the world differently than we do and whose company we might even enjoy. Third, we need to listen uh, to each other better than we do. And one of the most striking things about this political era is how often we talk at each other uh, and past each other rather than uh, to each other. Um, I uh, excerpt in, 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 in my book an exchange I had with a national radio uh, talk show host. Somebody actually I've never personally met, but I've gotten to know him over the years through email, and we've developed a, a friendship. But he, again, is very pro-Trump. I'm not. And it was May of 2017. I think I had written a piece in the New York Times, critical, very critical of Donald Trump for firing Jim Comey. And he was really agitated. So he wrote me. And um, he... Um, 
there is a back and forth. You all have probably experienced this when you can just sense that the emails or the temperatures going up. Uh, people are getting like more and more agitated. So this is going on, and it, so at some point it reached that he was making sort of personal accusations against me. I don't even remember what they were. Um, so again, my temptation was to respond uh, in kind, um, but I thought, A, I don't have the time to do it. Um, B, if I do it, I know how this is going to end, and I'm going to have to spend some time repairing the, uh, the relationship. Um, so um, I wrote him, and I actually admitted to him that my strong aversion to um, Trump made me susceptible, actually, to being unfair to him. Um, and then, uh, rather than answer the charges, I said, look, I'm happy to answer the charges you made if you want, but let me bracket those for now. Um, I tried to explain the competing perspectives, and this is what I wrote him. What I think is happening with the two of us is we're placing emphasis on different values, perceived virtues. You're, in, you're asking for loyalty, which keeps you from criticizing Trump, because in part, you don't want to be part, uh, be on the side of people on the left, Trump haters, for whom you have disdain. I'm asking for intellectual honesty, which means using the same standard on Trump you'd use on Hillary Clinton or Obama, and giving voice to criticism when you honestly believe that criticisms are warranted. This explains why you get frustrated with me for, in your eyes, being disloyal and being a willing participant in the anti-Trump mob. Well, I get frustrated with you for, in my eyes, not showing intellectual honesty when it comes to Trump for not saying things that you privately know to be true. But what's notable was his response, which is he expressed genuine gratitude um, for it, and he said, I received everything you said tonight fully. In fact, I read over your note a couple times, and I've had one of those cathartic moments. I believe the disconnect you and I experience regarding Trump world is the difference between objectivity and subjectivity. You endeavor to be objective, he told me, adding, it hit me like a ton of bricks. I have no desire to be objective. That's my blind spot, I suppose. I'm a journalist. I'm an opinion guy. Um, and so he went on to say that it didn't make either one of us right or wrong. Um, but that we were just uh, approaching this wild ride in a different way. Then a year later, I was r driving down the GW Parkway to work, and I was listening to his show, and it, had it was just after the Parkland, Florida shooting, and there were, the, um, you may remember that some of the high school students led up an effort uh, to, uh, a gun control effort. And this guy's audience is like really hard right, and they were really angry. And to his credit, he said, look, you can challenge their views uh, on Second Amendment, but don't go after those kids. He said, I have socks that are older than some of these high school students. <laughs> and I wrote him a note, and I said, I, I really appreciate the fact that you, um, that you um, said that to your, to your uh, audience, because I know they're not going to be happy about it. And he said, and he wrote a note of appreciation, but then he said, you know, that voice you hear, um, on the radio, uh, it's not always me, that it's sometimes you. And I'm better for having had that interchange, those interchanges with him, and so is, um, so is he. But it's a very different model than I had with Joe Klein. It's a very different model, as I said, than I had years ago. I think a few other things. I think we need to venture out of our ideological bubbles. We all need uh, to do this, myself included. Um, which is to spend time with people with whom we disagree and listen carefully to them, uh, to give them some benefit of the doubt, to perhaps learn something from them, and to take it upon ourselves to internalize their best uh, rather than their caricatured arguments. In San Francisco, there's an organization uh, called the Long Now Foundation. The point of the Long Now debates is not win-lose. The point is public uh, clarity, nuance, and deeper understanding. And here's how they the debates work in, in, uh, in practice. There are two debaters, so let's say it's Alice and Bob. Alice takes the podium, makes her argument, then Bob takes her place. But before he can present his counter-argument, he has to summarize Alice's argument to her satisfaction, a demonstration of respect and good faith. And only when Alice agrees that Bob has got it right is he permitted to proceed with his own argument. And then when he's finished, Alice has to summarize it to his satisfaction. So this is a threat uh, to uh, the us versus them attitude, to the children of light versus the children of darkness narrative. 
So if you believe strongly in gay rights and same-sex marriage, find a well-spoken evangelical or Catholic or social conservative who holds a different view and listen to them, hear them out before you argue with them. Do the same thing on gun control policy, on abortion, on climate change, on charter schools, the list goes on. Be open to being corrected, to hearing a different point of view, to de-escalating animus in your own life. It's not likely that you're gonna change their mind or vice versa. The point is that hopefully some mutual understanding can happen, and in some cases, some recalibration in how you think about things. Um, the fifth thing I would say is to recover uh, the deep purpose of dialogue and debate. Um, there's a great story that C.S. Lewis tells in Surprised by Joy, which is a sort of spiritual autobiography. And he's talking about um, first friends and second friends. His first friend is Arthur Greaves, whom Lewis knew since they were children. And Lewis describes the first friend as the person that sees the world the same way you do. You start the sentence, that person that uh, can complete it. He describes it as uh, raindrops coming together on a window. Um, that person is your alter ego. The second friend for him was Owen Barfield, who was a poet and a British philosopher. And um, Lewis uh, described the second friend as the person who's not your alter ego, but your anti-self. That's the person who sees the world differently than you do, who reads all the same books that you do and draws all the wrong conclusions from them, <laughs> as, uh, as Lewis said. Um, and Lewis and Barfield uh, had some pretty intense debates. They were, they were rather esoteric. Uh, they were on the role of um, imagination and truth. Um, but this is what Lewis wrote um, about, uh, about uh, he and Barfield. You go at it, hammer and tong, far into the night, or uh, walking through the fine country that neither gives a glance to, each learning the weight of the other's punches, and often more like mutually respectful enemies than friends. Actually, though it never seems so at the time, you modify one another's thoughts out of this perpetual dogfight, a community of mind and a deep affection emerges. And the punchline here is that both Lewis and Barfield treasured their relationship precisely because they saw the world in a different way. They felt like it widened the aperture of truth that they were better together than they were apart. And uh, Barfield later said that in argument, uh, we always, both of us, Lewis and I, were arguing for the truth, not for victory. That's just a very, very different way of, um, of viewing these things. Um, in political debates, we assume wisdom resides with us and not our opponents. There's nothing intrinsically wrong with that. It's the reason we hold the views we do. And so when I see uh, many Republicans I once worked alongside of defend Donald Trump, regardless of his actions, invoking defenses that I'm certain would enrage them if uh, champions of President Hillary Clinton had said the same thing on her behalf, I'm convinced we're seeing a severe case of confirmation bias, that tendency to interpret new evidence as a confirmation of one's existing beliefs. But here's the thing, what's easy to see in others is hard to see in ourselves. I can assure myself that my intellectual integrity is superior to theirs, and yet in my honest moments, I recognize that I struggle with the same human frailties and flaws. I have some of the same mental habits that I'm critical of in others. I relay all of this because confirmation bias is far more difficult to overcome than mo most of us like to admit. We're ever in search of data that confirms what we want to believe. Illusion is the first of all pleasures, Voltaire said. We're particularly tempted by delusions if they constitute bricks in the walls we have chosen to build and to live behind. We're also learning that there is a physiological appeal to confirmation bias. Since processing information that supports our belief system triggers a dopamine rush. So you literally get a high when you're getting information that confirms your pre-existing belief. And our brainers are hardwired to embrace or reject information uh, that confirms or challenges our pre-existing attitudes. So it's literally painful for people to try and process information that's contrary to what they already believe. Our beliefs are often tied up with our ideas about who we are individually and our group identity. Um, so if, if you're in a group and you say and speak things that are contrary to what that group believes, you can become a pariah. And that's a hard thing to do because we all need, need community. 
And so the result uh, is that changing our beliefs in light of new evidence can cause us to be rejected. And no one likes being accused of disloyalty. But being on the periphery, at least of my own party, Republican Party, uh, has given me a renewed appreciation for what John Buchan, who's a beautiful novelist um, and writer, a politician of the mid 20th century, said. While I believe in party government and in party loyalty, I never attain to the happy partisan zeal of many of my friends, being painfully aware of my own and my party's de defects and uneasily conscious of the merits of my opponents. I found through hard experience that uh, the view can be clearer from the periphery than from the center of power. Confirmation bias is deepening political polarization, which is already at record levels. Our political culture is sick and getting sicker, and the confirmation bias is now a leading toxin. It won't be drained from our political bloodstream by conservatives lecturing liberals or vice versa. We have to begin with people in our own tribe, with people who have standing in our own lives. We need to emphasize greater epistemological modesty on our side and greater appreciation for the perspective of the other side. We have to look within and see ourselves and our limitations with fresh eyes. To say that we all struggle with confirmation bias is not to say that some individuals don't overcome it better than others and that some aren't closer to seeing the truth of things better than others. Objective reality exists, truth matters, and then we have to pursue them with purpose and without fear. But in our present moment, truth, including truth that unsettles us, has far too often become subordinate to justifying, defending at all costs our own often unsound preconceptions. You can see that in others, but can you see it in yourself? Can I see it in myself? So let me conclude with, uh, with, with several thoughts. One is, um, I believe really deeply that we have to reject cynicism and despair. We are not passive actors in this drama. We're not corks caught in a river current. The problems that have been created have been largely created by us, and they can be solved by us. So we're not powerless. A lot of people in conversations I have speak about the, the present condition in America as if it's, we're seized by a lethal disease, that there's simply no, no cure to it. But that's not what the situation is. The second is don't lose perspective. Um, this country has been through a lot harder times than what we're going through now. Uh, if you go back and read the, about the election of 1800 between Jefferson and Adams, historians say that almost tore the young republic apart, the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. That was a vicious time. Uh, there was the Civil War, which literally tore the country uh, apart. 700,000 dead in a country of 29 million. That would be the equivalent today of 7 million dead. Um, think about, for, for those of you who, who, who are uh, lived at that time, old enough to remember the late 60s and early 70s. Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy assassinated within a matter of months. The riots in the streets that began in Watts and then spread throughout the country. The Vietnam War, the march in the Pentagon, students uh, violently taking over universities. We had the sexual revolution, the Stonewall riots in the early 70s, the National Guard shooting at Kent State. Uh, when I was doing research for my book, in a period, 18-month period between 71 and 72, there was an average of five domestic bombings a day in the United States. Um, so we're, we're not at that point. And the American capacity for self-renewal is extraordinary. We have found time and time again the capacity to regain our equilibrium. Third, the good news is that people are, are deeply uh, unhappy with the current state of affairs. If they were satisfied, I'd be more worried than I am. But they're not satisfied everywhere I go, maybe everywhere you go. Uh, I'm hearing the same thing, which is we're better than this, and we're tired of the acrimony and the antipathy and the hatred, and that's a good sign. Viruses create their own antibodies, um, qualities that we once cherished. And it, it, I found this in the life of an individual and in the life of a country. Uh, if there are qualities that you once cherish and they're stripped away, you then are reminded why you cherish them to begin with. And then, having seen them stripped away, you might be willing um, to fight for them again and to restore them. And we have to decide what things are worth fighting for, um, what great achievements in history and social reforms um, need to be overcome. But others have, but they've always been high hurdles. Uh, and just remember, as people of, of the Christian faith, for those of you who are, who are of that faith, we're called to be faithful, we're not called to be successful. That is really up to, uh, 
up to God. Fourth, attitudes can change. Whatever you think about same-sex marriage, for or against, for decades and decades and decades, the gay rights movement was seen as a transgressive movement. Um, and um, what happened is it moved from a transgressive to a traditionalist movement, really because of two people in particular, Andrew Sullivan and Jonathan Rauch. Uh, Andrew was the first person who wrote a cover story in the New Republic. I think it was actually in 89. Uh, and then John Rauch. And if you read their arguments, they made them um, relentlessly, thoughtfully, never ad hominem, never went after their critics, called them homophobes. Um, Andrew actually put out an anthology of the best arguments for and against same-sex marriage. And over time, they persuaded people, um, both by the power of their arguments and I think by introducing people to the human stories. Um, of, that, that were behind the, uh, the statistics. Um, but if you had said in 1990 that, that, that by the time we, we came to this moment that same-sex marriage uh, would have strong majority support in the country and the law of the land, people would have looked at you and said uh, no. And then you look at the Me Too movement, which I think is one of the most important um, and significant and hopeful, though painful, movements in, in generations. Um, it's the pain because you see um, the awful um, assaults that women um, experienced really on a regular basis. Um, but it's something that had to be exposed and that's part of the road to healing both for those people as individuals but also for the country. But that thing changed in the blink of an eye. That was really the Harvey Weinstein story and an entire attitude change. So, um, so things can change quicker than, uh, than we think. So we need people with a deep commitment to the truth and a vision of the good. One of my favorite lines from uh, poetry is from Wordsworth, The Prelude, which is an endlessly long poem. Uh, but in it, uh, Wordsworth has this line, which is what we have loved, others will love, and we will teach them how. And it seems to me that's part of our task, which is to love the right things and then to teach other people why they should love those things um, as well. Um, it was June uh, 1966 when Bobby Kennedy um, traveled to South Africa. It was a five-day trip. Uh, he went uh, to Soweto, which was the largest uh, black township at that time, Johannesburg, which was the largest city, uh, and the uh, University of Cape Town. Uh, and this was a really important moment. Apartheid was at its peak. It was important because no senator had ever gone to South Africa. This wasn't just any senator. It was a Kennedy. And um, during that Cape Town speech, uh, uh, Bobby Kennedy, it was one of his most memorable ones. And he was speaking to young people in particular, and he warned about what he called the dangers of futility, the belief there's nothing one man or one woman can do against the enormous array of the world's ills, against misery and ignorance, injustice and violence, and Kennedy urged people to have the moral courage to enter the conflict, to fight for their ideals, and using words that would later be engraved on his uh, gravesite at Arlington Cemetery said this, few will have the greatness to bend history itself, but each of us can work to change a small portion of events, and in the total of all those acts will be written the history of this generation. Each time a man stands up for an ideal, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope, and those ripples build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. And we're not living in South Africa in 1966. We're not facing apartheid. Uh, we do have some stiff challenges, but we can stand up for high ideals. We can send forth tiny ripples of hope. And those ripples can build a current which can advance justice, which can advance what is true and right and beautiful, and which can tame the savageness of man and make gentle the life of this world. Thanks very much.